live. Jay, thank you for coming on the show. Let's start off. First question. <laughs> show. Now, uh, what's your favorite superhero? Oh, my favorite superhero. Man, that's a tough one. I don't have a, I don't have a prepared answer. But um, for whatever reason, I've always liked Batman. Maybe that's just because the movies are so well done. But uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. There's, there's a good story there. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, normally, and I think uh, I got that question from uh, David Burkus, who's a network science uh, guy. And you can tell a lot about a person, I think, nowadays, not previously by the superhero they choose because the wide array of superheroes that are uh, out now and like Marvel's ridiculous at storytelling. So most mm-hmm. of them Marvel movies. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't know. I haven't really thought through it. So maybe I'll change my answer if I had a few minutes, but maybe it says <laughs> something that that was my first answer. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, mine's Captain America. Love Captain okay. America. Yeah, I would definitely not pick him. So maybe yeah. that does say something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, So Batman's great because, and I know a lot of people choose him because he's like the human who like competes with all these people and like just wants the good for the city and like is willing to tamper in the darkness to find the good. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Captain America is honestly very similar. He just gets his powers because he's so on a definite purpose that he's just like, man, this is it. This is what I want to do. And then he's like grabbing Thor's hammer and like, holding Thanos' hand, he's doing all this shit, and I'm like, and he's the strongest one, and no one sees it. Like, (laughs) like he crashes and gets frozen in ice for, like, 60 years, and he's just like, "Uh oh, there's a whole new world out there. Okay, whatever. I'll live in this one. Yeah, no, I I get it. I don't know. Maybe you're you're starting to convince me. (laughs) (laughs) No, he's he's just my favorite. But before we were just talking about, and I was about to move into it, wanted to set it live. Where did you start your journey with nutrition and uh, understanding and trying to really figure out uh, health? Yeah. um, Well, it started a long time ago when I was young. I was I was pretty interested in fitness and and health and nutrition. I was I was an athlete. So, you know, doing whatever I could to perform better, build muscle, um, you know, and it kind of grew from there, just became really passionate about it and wanting to you know, it, it turned into more health focused as opposed to just performance focused. Not that those, there's necessarily a big difference there, but, um, yeah. And it grew from there. I decided, you know, with that passion, I was going to be a doctor and, um, maybe it was probably around that time. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so I went pre-med in college and around that time I started finding, you know, all these diets online. I found the paleo diet and, um, kind of jumped in from there, found intermittent fasting and ketogenic diets and had some symptoms and, you know, did more experimentation yeah. and, uh, yeah, I mean, it all, it all kind of grew from there. Hell yeah. Yeah. I think that's, uh, it's interesting. I think, uh, pre-med as a major is something that people choose because they one want to figure out things about themselves more than helping others. I mean, that's most, major, most things you're going to do because you want to figure it out for yourself. Like you're going yeah, for yeah. psychology. It's like, I, want, I need to map my brain. What's, like what's going on up here? But then when you figure out that medicine isn't necessarily the, the ultimatum, you figure out there's health, there's prevention, there's wellness, there's biohacking, all these random things. I think it changes a lot of people's mindset about what is going on. So from there, you took it and you started your wellness, uh, helping people with training and doing all these other things. How did that evolve? Yeah, well, so, I mean, the, the biggest reason why I decided to move away from pre-med was seeing how doctors are trained to treat conditions, you know, well, more, more accurately treat symptoms. Yep. And uh, yeah, I started having some issues with that. So from there, it, it evolved. So as I learned more about health and nutrition, um, I, decided that I, I decided that the best way to go about teaching somebody isn't to give them the answer per se. So rather than giving them a meal plan or or, um, I don't know, a specific workout to do or, um, whatever it is. Yeah. It, it shifted into focusing more on the education piece, the understanding piece, which, you know, and, and we can explain this a little more, but that's really kind of where, where the healing is that, you know, that's, that's where yeah. if you're, if you're aimed at understanding, then you become successful. Whereas if you're just aimed yeah. at figuring out what to do, you end up lost. Totally. That's all the the free courses. Anything that you get from free for free or you pirate, you will never be utilized the way that 
it would be if you put in the energy to figure it out or pay for it at the beginning. Like that's yeah. 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 Well, and it's, yeah. So from there, I mean, I created a course that's not free, <laughs> although I do have a lot of free content too, articles and videos, but yeah, so it's all kind of aimed at teaching people about health from, from the understanding perspective and first off teaching people why that's important and yeah. why it doesn't work when you're just focused on that surface level of what do I do? And then, you know, trying to help somebody build that foundation, that foundational understanding of health, nutrition, their body and uh, then from there, you they can determine what they need to do themselves. Totally. Yeah. It's like, if you don't even understand that, if you don't understand the basis of your body and you're like, God, my stomach hurts and you're grabbing like the right side of your body, you're like, that's your liver. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, it becomes very hard one to even know what is going on inside of you because like people go to the doctor, like this is wrong. It's like, eh, it's not that it's this they're like, what? No, it's gotta be this. It's like, no, you just don't know anything about what you're talking about. Right. Well, yeah. And, and when you're exposed to everyone who's saying different things, you get lost, you know, it's, it's all this conflicting information. You don't know what to do with it. And that's one of the main reasons why I think it's important to focus on the, on that deeper level to understanding and digging into the physiology in this case to, to, so you can determine your own truth, you know, otherwise you, you're just working off of blind faith and that yeah. doesn't get you anywhere. No, totally. And so I wanted to move more into, uh, then what, the the foundations of health are and kind of this holistic uh, mentality versus uh, specification or hey uh, my foot hurts so it's got to be my foot might not be your foot yeah <laughs> um, yeah I mean so I don't know you, I think it's it's important that we recognize that the interaction between our bodies and our environment is is what kind of produces our health you could say. And so there's obviously various aspects of our environment. We have the food that we're eating. We have our, our movement and sunlight exposure and psychological stress and, um, I don't know, social interaction mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and all of those. So all of those things affect us on many levels and, and health is, I think health is one of those foundational levels too, that really affects virtually everything else. It affects the way that we think and our outlook on life. It affects our ability to work and be productive or creative or, whatever it is. So, so I think that starting it, I think that it's, I don't know what, I know that you talk about high leverage skills and I think that learning about your health is, is just like, it, it's foundational. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, if you don't understand your health or you're not taking control of it and you're trying to be highly productive, start a business, uh, have good relationships, do whatever it is. There's always this like mental, like, fog or like oh but this one thing's wrong or oh my god like I have a rash why do I have a rash well it's because you eat something you shouldn't eat now you got some flames and now it's exposing itself on your skin and you feel embarrassed to go in public it all plays into everything everything's connected but yeah 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 well and so as you were saying when you specify or when you zoom too far in on one of those particular aspects of the of our interaction with our environment you lose sight of the other ones and there, you know, there's so many things that you could be missing that could be playing a role in whatever you're experiencing. Totally. So at a fundamental level, what is the, the basis for good health? Um, okay. So I would, I would say that the, on the most fundamental level, it all comes down to energy. And that was the, the biggest, I don't want to say epiphany cause I didn't come up with it myself, you know, but yeah. the biggest, um, I don't know, most influential experience that I had when learning about health was this view of health through a bioenergetic lens. And so when you're, so, so energy you can, you know, it's, it's what allows each of our cells, <clears throat> it's what allows each of our cells to function, which allows our organs to function and allows us to think it's, you know, the, really the primary, most fundamental determinant of, of our experience. Yeah. Um, our emotions, our ability to be productive, kind of all these things we're talking about. So once you're looking at nutrition or exercise or any other experience that we have through this bioenergetic lens, it, it becomes clear. Whereas before you're trying to connect all these random dots. Um, yeah. And so, so that was the kind of this unifying theory that really brought it all together, at least for me. Um, that was just like an incredible, incredibly yeah. profound uh, change. Totally. And yeah, right now I'm reading this book called Healing and Voltage. 
and it's blowing my mind because on the aspect of energy, we often get lost in what energy is in a chemistry base level, meaning a calorie, a protein, carb, lipid, alcohol, whatever it is, you know, you one gram of something. Energy, quite literally, though, would be we could relate to electricity, right? Electricity is energy. So then you got to look at the voltage of a cell. Mm-hmm. And he's getting into if you're if the voltage of your cell is not at a high voltage or the voltage that it should be, I forget the range, it's like negative 15, negative 25 millivolts, then you're in a state of basically you're not healthy and you're probably degrading a bit. And then when you're healing, you you should go super electrically charged and it would then spike it so it could do the healing mechanism and then bring it back down. But I was like blown away. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't, I haven't looked at it from that perspective. I'd be interested to read that book, but um, yeah. So I've are you familiar with uh, Gilbert Ling? No, I'm not. His, so he's more on the physics side, which again is something that's that this I, as well. Okay, yeah. And so he talks about the structure of the cell as kind of the. It's kind of like that. the The structure is is uh, interdependent with the function. So. Yep. Um. By improving, so so the energy improves the structure or the structural complexity of the cell, and that's what allows it to function better. So I would wonder if how that relates to the voltage, and if there's a direct kind of uh, relationship yeah. between those two things, and they're both the same, you know, two sides of the same coin. Or I'd wonder if one precedes the other. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. I l- I almost believe the physics component of health more than the chemistry because chemistry. We can debate all day about studies, placebo, how it works, what happened. But physics is theoretically laws. I like to debate it as well. <laughs> I'm like, you can't, we can't say anything is definite because nothing has ever been definite in all of history. So why is anything definite today? Um, but he gets into some, some crazy things. And I don't know which one would precede the other. I would assume they would both codependently operate and it would be like the structure of the cell and how much energy it has would then allow it to function better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe we'll have to each read, read the others and then we'll come back and decide. But uh, yeah, because I mean, my understanding was that the primary determinant of the voltage of the cell was the uh, ion concentration intracellular versus extracellularly. So are you, is that what you're referring to or? He's not going to, he's just quite literally talking about the charge of the cell. Um, and so he's big on like, make sure you ground often because grounding is helping to get the electrons, get rid of the, uh, pos- why do I, I keep saying positrons. I've been saying it for the last like week and a half and it's protons. Um, <laughs> and just these different things that, uh, like for regenerating cells or, uh, he, he talked about how all of like our liver and like, I think it's four days or a week completely has cell turnover. So it's all all new cells on your liver should be right. Most people don't, but if you get your cells to that uh, specific voltage level and you do it in your liver through eating more fat, so butter, uh, raw milk and eggs are like his go-to is like eat butter, raw milk, eggs. If you feel nauseous, like this is off. He's like, then you can have the good cell turnover and everything works efficiently. So I, Right now, I'm just kind of like, uh, it's like 600 pages. I'm like 350 in. Okay. I'm kind of just like mapping out and like trying to put it into my model of what health is based on kind of Ray Pete's work and then a few other people. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and so Ray's work, a lot, of, well, not all of it, of course, but a lot of it as far as what he talks about on, on this cellular structural level comes from Gilbert Ling's work. And so really? now that I'm thinking about it a little more, so... From this Gilbert Ling model, you have the cellular, like you have the cytoskeleton of the cell, which is made up of proteins. And so the molecules that we typically consider as holding energy, like ATP, yeah. he, his whole idea is that the ATP, it, the energy doesn't come from breaking that third phosphate bond. Instead, it comes from this adsorbing quality of it, where it basically adsorbs onto the protein structure. And I think mm-hmm. it's transferring a negative charge to it okay which is what gives it its structure so perhaps this is very much in line with with that um that uh, book you were talking about totally so we're going super granular uh yeah yeah (laughs) i love like 
don't get me wrong, but if we zoom out, let's let's delve more into the practical and more of the experiential because that is what I think people are lacking when it comes to health. They don't even know what real health feels like. Yeah. Well, and, and so to, there's obviously a ton of dots to connect between that very deep cellular level and, yeah. and okay, what do you do? Um, <laughs> and I don't think that you need to get that deep on the cellular level. I mean, even just understanding that energy is the most fundamental process there. And then considering how the food we eat or how the things that we do affect and en- affect us exactly. on the level of yeah. energy, then we can move from there. So, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of things that we're doing, whether a lot of things that we're told that are healthy, um, whether it's kind of the more mainstream whole grains and vegetable yeah. oil kind of thing or, or the paleo thing. Um, I think that a lot of those aren't really in line with that view if you dig in enough. And um, so I think that that's steering a lot of people wrong. And I, I definitely agree that, that having a change in the way you feel is one of the best indicators. So, so one thing that I talk about is how you can only dig so deep through the research, through the physiology, like your understanding is limited. Um, but so the, the kind of antidote to that is experimentation. So because like we can use our understanding to inform our experimentation and based on what we know, we can then choose to experiment with different foods or different exercises or yeah. whatever it is. Um, and then from there we can kind of put those two things together and, and, and in this case, using a result like how you feel is a great indicator to determine if what you're doing is right for you, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, totally. And with this stuff, so I like to look for a few things to know if someone's good or bad when it comes to this stuff. Number one, one of the easiest things is uh, if you close your hand, is it harder to close it throughout the day? Like what's going on? Like, do you have inflammation there? Because, like, people don't realize that, too, after you eat food, are your fingertips rosy? Like, do you heat up? Are you, is your hands and feet, are they always cold? Well, that's a really bad sign. Or is it tip of your nose, your ears, is that cold? Because blood flow should be going there, but it's not because it's pulling towards something that it thinks more pressing. There's all these, like, little things. Moon face is one of the biggest ones. Like, people who have hypothyroidism, they start to get into that. They develop, like, a moon-looking face. Mm-hmm, sure. Like oval. Same with the belly, actually, uh, you get that like beer belly, the gut belly, that's mm-hmm. typically hypothyroidism and all this. It's this stuff that I think if you talk people about, and I think you do, that then they understand, okay, wait, I'm actually not healthy. Oh, all these things actually line up. Yeah, yeah, cold hands, and like all those ones that you mentioned, the cold hands and feet especially, I think is a good one. Taking your temperature and pulse yep. um, at certain times, you know, depending on what you're eating and everything that those can be good indicators of metabolic health. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of some others. I mean, just general fatigue. Um, one thing that was, one thing that was the biggest difference for me and it wasn't necessarily an indicator of how healthy I was per se. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But so one thing is that I was always living somewhat restricted in my eating. So yes. it, yeah. So, so, from when I was young, I wanted to be lean. So I, I just was eating less because that was what you know, you're told to do. If you're exercising a lot, you just got to eat less and you get leaner. Um, so I was doing that for a while. And then on the keto diets, like I was eating as much as I wanted to eat. Um, or when I was intermittent fasting, obviously I wasn't eating then. But when I was eating meals, I would eat as much as I wanted, but I was still hungry. Like I was never satisfied, mm-hmm. um, especially from the carbohydrate standpoint. I always was craving carbohydrates. Um, and when I was young, you know, I would binge because I would not be eating them. And then I would, you know, binge one night, you know, when you're susceptible or weak or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, and it's not that you're actually weak, of course. And that's kind of what I'm getting at is that once I started eating in a way where I was actually satisfied and I wasn't living with this constant hunger that never went away, even if I was physically full after a meal, like this constant hunger yeah. and dissatisfaction was always there. And so that was by far the biggest difference for me. You know, I mean, there's, there's many oh. symptoms that changed, but that was a huge one was, was just the relief, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> this, this feeling that yeah. I don't want to eat more, regardless of how full I am or whatever, I always wanted to eat more and, and feeling actually satisfied. It's, it's incredibly relieving. It's, it's, yeah. it's free, freeing. Yeah. It's, that was, that was a big so, change for me. Yeah. And this is one of those concepts. So like I spent like three months, just, I said, I, me and uh, Tim did an experiment. We were like, fuck it. 
eat everything that we want to. And like, I'm not telling you, or I'm not kidding. We gained like 25 pounds in like three months. Like, <laughs> Cause we were just like, okay, whatever. Like we could eat whatever. And most people would be like, it's so wrong, blah, blah, blah. It's bad for your health, all this stuff. The thing is one health is a super long-term thing. Like you're not going for health next week. You're not like, I got to be healthy next week or I got to be ripped next week. If you are, you won't be one healthy if you get ripped next week or two ripped if you're trying to get healthy next week. <laughs> but one of the main things when it comes to health is your mindset. It's who you are. And it's a disconnect between I want these foods or I don't want these foods. Like food itself doesn't affect you badly. You are the one eating it and making it affect you. Like, again and i talk about this with so many things because i hate when people blame something that's an inanimate object they're like that's the worst thing ever i'm like dude you're doing something with it that's why it's bad it wasn't bad a minute ago but now it's sitting there and it is bad when you let yourself just eat everything and you take a while diet break mind you whatever it is i don't like the term diet either but uh your mind clears up like what you were saying where you don't feel restricted. And then you're like, wait, why is all this weight? Why am I losing weight? Oh, I got back into my hunger and my body naturally has and all this stuff and everything that lines up. It, it is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of that Matt stone refeeding. I don't know yeah. if you know Matt stone, but yeah, yeah. That's um, actually how we started that. We were like, he says eat everything. So let's just try it. <laughs> then we gained too much. And we were like, okay, let's backtrack. Let's, figure this out, what was good, what was bad about it, and then move from there. Yeah, and I think that can work for some people when, if, if they have a really, I don't know, I don't want to say bad, but if, if they have a rough relationship with food, um, I think that that can be a helpful yeah. practice, you know, to, or, you know, like experiment or something to kind of work on that relationship. But yeah, as you're saying, it, it definitely isn't ideal as far as health goes. So, yeah. um, I mean, I would prefer to kind of, skip that step if possible and just transition slowly into changing what you eat and still getting to that point. But, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, obviously there's, there's individuality. So totally. It yeah, and it, yeah. It was more of an experiment than I would say. I don't really approach things as like, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing it to get X or Y, mm -hmm. uh, more of like, we'll see like based on the results, what happens and then fine tune from there. So it was more of like, Hey, find everything, see what you like, what you don't like, how you feel during like different foods. And then, I mean, after that, it was like, okay, cool. I can just go back to what I was doing because I actually liked it. <laughs> you end up realizing, like, it's uh, like the hero's journey. At the very end of the hero's journey, you're back to normal circumstance and just choose the right thing. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. I'll just take that. Thanks. <laughs> it becomes easy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and – so, so one thing that I think is really important, just touching on this subject of letting go and this relationship with food, um, is there's this idea that we need to be willing ourselves to be eating less mm -hmm. and, you know, people beating themselves up when they're overweight or, or just for, you know, for eating that food that, as you're talking about, that they are calling bad. Um, you know, I think that it's important to recognize why that hunger is there, why we like those certain foods. And it's not, it's not necessarily a matter of willpower you know, your hunger is, is re regulated by so many different metabolic processes that it's like, like hunger is physiological. It's not yeah. quote unquote mental, but there is no quote unquote mental, you know, there's no separation there between our emotions or our thoughts or feelings of wh whatever it is, yeah. such as hunger and our physiology, you know, they're, they're tightly intertwined. Yeah. And that's where I get so annoyed with, uh, keto or eating any certain way and you're like, I feel so much better this week. I'm like, there's adrenaline and cortisol. Like, you, you just feel good. You feel good for a little bit, don't you? And then you're going to come back and be like, why didn't it work? I tried everything. You didn't try everything. You tried one thing that you thought was the Holy Grail and it didn't work again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so many people have those experiences and a lot of people stick with it because they're so, you know, they're running on this blind faith that what they're doing is right. And you know, they'll use their willpower to run themselves into a ditch, you know? Yeah. And it's, we're humans. Almost yeah, everything yeah. is individualized. It's just how it works. And it may suck when you're doing, you're trying to do X diet or Y diet. But again, it comes back to the fundamentals and the foundation of what you're doing, just like what you teach. Yeah, definitely. hundred percent agree. Yeah. And it's in that. So 
moving more towards the the practical and the application of this, what would you normally, I wouldn't say prescribe because I hate that word too, because doctors use it. What would you say to do, or at least experiment with it at the beginning in order to start this uh, mindset and this thinking behind, hey, this is the fundamentals, here's what I should try, here's how I should be experimenting, and then from there, I can build on top of the fun, uh, the fundamentals, the blueprint that I built out at the beginning. Yeah, so as you said, I mean, there's a lot of individuality to this. Um, so there's there's not, you know, a typical recommendation per se. Um, and, and again, so so my my goal and the way that my, a lot of my articles are, are intended to be. And, and my course definitely is it's, so it's explaining to someone these fundamental components of our health. So we start at energy, we talk about blood sugar and gut function and um, I don't know, all, all sorts of different kind yeah. of baseline aspects and then talk about how foods affect those things. So we talk about different carbohydrates and how sugar affects that and what foods are, you know, have sugar in them and, and all that kind of thing. Talk about protein, different fats and how all those things affect our physiology. And then I try for the most part to leave it up to the individual to say, okay, mm -hmm. I understand that sugar increases blood sugar and it does X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to try drinking some orange juice, you know, and, and I do make recommendations for, for different yeah. foods and, and different maybe meals. And, you know, so there's some guidance, but I, but I, I don't typically have a blanket recommendation i mean as far as like the most like like there's a few more fundamental problems with problems is a bad word but but things that people are eating or not eating that mm -hmm. i think are issues so polyunsaturated fats are a huge one so yeah. i mean that's yeah. one of the first things is take out the vegetable oils probably nuts and seeds um yep. all hydrogenated fish. anything hydrogenated uh See, and this is where he was going into in the healing is voltage. He's like hydrogenated oils are typically plastic because they've cooked them at 350 to 425 for long enough to where it just will live forever. Well, it's interesting you say that. I don't know too much about the process of hydrogenation, but Me neither. <laughs> well, my understanding is that it's basically taking an unsaturated fat and adding hydrogens to it so it's saturated. So it's turning an unsaturated, like let's say polyunsaturated yeah. fat from corn oil and turning it into a saturated fat. So I know I've, I've heard repeat suggest that that's actually better than really? just leaving it unsaturated, but I don't, I don't know too many of the details of the actual process of hydrogenation. So I yeah. can't really I mean, say yeah. either way, but I, I mean, I, there's no good food that has hydrogenated oil in it exactly. anyway. So unless you're just getting straight hydrogenated coconut oil or something, which I know Ray's talked about doing, but interesting. I, yeah. That's yeah. true. Um, but yeah. So, so anyways, yeah, polyunsaturated fats, I think are one of the biggest. And, and again, we, this all comes down to this level of energy where they inhibit the production of energy through various mechanisms. So, um, polyunsaturated fats are big, getting enough good quality protein is big. Um, but some people also, I mean, it's in the health sphere, it's common to eat too much protein because carbs are considered to be bad and fats considered to be bad. So you're just left with protein and, and lettuce. <laughs> and so people are just, you know, downing chicken breast all day and, and that can be problematic too. Um, so getting a good range of protein, um, would is up there in the top couple things. And then also getting good quality carbohydrates, especially for people who are low carb and uh, ketogenic. So those are kind of like the three, I would say most important aspects that I think people should start with. Um, but I, again, like I, I hesitate saying that because I think it's, it's more important to understand why, because otherwise you're going to miss the nuances. You're not going to understand, yep. you know, as someone else then says, no, you shouldn't be eating carbohydrates. How are you going to know what, like whether you should or shouldn't, you know? Um, yeah. So for, so, so anyways, yeah, those, those would be kind of the three more important things I think to start. Totally. And it comes to the level of, if you zoom out a bit and you're like, why am I doing this in the first place? Stress reduction, often that's huge. Um, feeling better with more energy, again, that's huge. And doing that with warm hands and feet, not cold hands and feet, because that's adrenaline better. And I think that's where the individual variations really come in, because one food might stress you out, doesn't stress him out, but if you understand it and you've built those foundational principles of, hey, fat carbs, here's how these different hormones work, all this, 
then it's like, oh, okay, I can't do that. I can do this. Awesome. Yeah, it's like creating a toolbox to experiment with. Exactly. Creating tools that I guess you would put in a toolbox. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's all good. You're just build the toolbox. Don't really look at it, but know that you have all the tools. Like most people are like, ah, oh. and then you win that day when you go in, you're like, yeah, I don't have a screwdriver. Okay, let's go back and figure <laughs> this one out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and that's, you know, that's kind of the best part is when you have that open mind to to learning and open mind to being wrong not holding your beliefs too tightly. Um, then when you dig into whatever that screwdriver is, um, you know, it, like if you come away with, with, I don't know, that's when you find truth. It's when you find yeah. you, you, that's when you actually learn, you know? Totally. Yeah. So then on the topic of biohacking and stuff like that, what are your general thoughts? Do you use anything that quote unquote would be considered biohacking. And I know literally when I was uh, 17, I wanted to like ask my counselor like, Hey, where can I go to school to learn biohacking? And I just <laughs> knew that they would not even understand what the word meant. So I was like, mm, I'll just choose neuroscience. Okay. Uh, but what do you think about it? And are you using anything currently that uh, quote unquote is biohacking? Um, well, okay. So, while we're on the definition aspect mm -hmm. by biohacking, you're just suggesting like technology that we use to improve our environment or, or what, what, how would you define it? So, yeah, I would just say biohacking, um, in this aspect, because the, the normal one is like something that makes you bio, I don't know, hacks biology, whatever it is, something that is out of the norm for increasing health. That's what we'll just say. That's my, normally, that's how I use it because I use okay. the word because I'm like, ah, oh, oh yeah, it's just quote unquote biohacking. Yeah. Um, do I use anything that would be considered biohacking? Um, I don't know. I mean, I use techniques like meditation. I, my diet is, is definitely not typical. Yeah. Um, my exercise probably isn't typical. Um, what, are, what are you doing for exercise nowadays? Um, well, so it's transitioned a little bit. I've, I've been into kickboxing and Muay Thai for a little while now, well, several years now. And, um, I also just recently came across functional patterns, mm -hmm. you know them? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, several months ago. And so I, I've been learning a lot more about that and trying to implement a lot of what they're talking about. I like the, I like the perspective from which they're coming at movement and, um, posture and, and. Totally. I guess, yeah. So, so I've been experimenting with that uh, quite a bit lately as far as exercise goes. So yeah, I don't know if you call that a biohack. I use a little cross ball. So <laughs> to, yeah. to, for myofascial release, I don't know if that's a biohack, but. <laughs> um, Are you using any red lights, inversion tables, stuff like that or not right now? Um, never used inversion tables. Uh, I try to get sunlight. I'm in Tampa, so yeah. it's not normally too hard. Um, I have never used red light. I've used incandescent or halogen lights, mm -hmm. like big floodlights, um, just to get a, a wider spectrum as opposed to just a couple of wavelengths. Totally. Um, done acupuncture. Yeah, I don't. I don't really. I don't really think anything else. I don't know. Would, right, yeah. Yeah, I'm, it would fall under biohacking. I have. Uh, I wear mouth tape for uh, at night to sleep. Okay. Make sure. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm I might have to try that. I mean, I, so I was doing, I know that you interviewed, um, Patrick McCown. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. So, and I, I did Buteco for a while. Um, I still try to do the exercises sometimes. I definitely found a lot of benefit from it. I never actually did the mouth taping though. So maybe like, something that's worth trying. Yeah. I mean, it's so easy. It's like, okay, I'm sleeping. I don't have to do anything. I'll just tape it and then breathe in the mouth. It's super easy. Um, I like it a lot. Uh, and I think it is helping. I don't wake up with stuffy noses anymore. I don't uh, wake up with like that head cold or like fatigue. Does it, is it just from that? I have no idea. I'm always doing a million things. So I have the red light, I have the pink and white salt lamp. I'm trying to get ground a bunch, inversion table, whatever it is, who knows. But I don't really care because I'm like, <laughs> if it's working, it's working, it's fine. And if I need to isolate the variable later for a specific reason, so be it. But for right now, I'm like, let's just throw all the spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess there's something to be said for that approach too. <laughs> yeah. No, but I'm similar. I mean, with, uh, 
I, we did, I did some martial arts for a bit. I need to get back into it when I was in Florida. And then, but for the past probably two and a half years, I've just been obsessed with movement. So like my structure, my routine is like, so it doesn't even make sense. I've been like dead sore the past few days, but I want to do the powerlifting, the uh, contra- cons- uh, yeah, contraction, but I also like the straight arm stuff and I like the movement based principles. So it's, uh, I'm dead at the end of my gym session. Then I do the yeah, it's a- and then I do the cold shower. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. I used to do that. I was doing a gymnastics program and mm-hmm. also lift power lifting at the same time. And yeah, I've done similar things, but, uh, yeah, right now I'm really only doing movement based things. So Muay Thai kickboxing and the functional patterns exercises. Awesome. So if there, what is the number one thing that you think you want to help spread in health in the movement itself? Well, I think it would depend on what level we're talking about. So mm-hmm. I'm stuck between two answers. One would just be this bioenergetic view. So I think yeah. that that elucidates the rest of the, um, everything else from there, you know, the, which foods are best or ideal for our health and what I, you know, how to exercise, things like that. So, um, that's, I think that that's may, maybe that the other, one would just be the open-minded critical thinking aspect. Totally. And the reason why I might choose that one is because I think that blindly follow, as I, as I've kind of mentioned a few times, I think that the blind faith blindly following be, something because somebody says it's right is the larger problem, not just in health, but really everywhere. Yeah. And so if everyone is blindly following this, I don't know, this bioenergetic view, I don't think that would really be all that successful anyways. Perfect. Awesome. So that's, that's actually perfect for what is your higher level skill? And I, I normally I would describe it, but I know, you know, a little bit about what they are and how they function. So if there is one, you can definitely riff on many if you have them, but what do you use constantly that you're like, yes, this is it. This is like, I know that I can pick this up, put it down and it will have repeatable good results. Um, Yes. First off, I think it's a cool idea. It's not something I'd heard of before you, but um, I think I would have to go back to the, to the learning how to learn critical thinking, open-mindedness aspect. And I don't know if that would fall into a higher leverage skill. You have to let me know. But um, yeah, cause I think again, like I think in whatever realm, whatever topic, whatever um, field we're talking, whether it's health and nutrition or economics or history or more specifically medicine, you know, whatever it is, I think that uh, politics, especially yeah. God, politics um, is people are, are blindly following whatever it is. And firstly, they, I think that some of the closed mindedness comes from not understanding something. So you're, you're more defensive and not as, as open to um, trying to look at something objectively or look at the opposite point of view or un- try to understand where someone else is coming from. And instead you kind of close up. Totally. And yeah, I think that that's, I mean, that's huge right now. I think that that's, I mean, especially politics, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but yeah. And, and I don't know. I mean, that I know because from experience, I mean, I was one of those people who maybe I wasn't, maybe I wasn't trying to, you know, close off to what anybody else has to say, but I definitely held beliefs somewhat strongly that I didn't really know too much about, or I didn't really understand. And as I learn more about them, not only do I stop holding them strongly, but sometimes my view would change. So I think that that's really where the biggest yeah. change is, is necessary totally. if we want to move in a good direction. And that's also intellectual honesty. And I think the more that people utilize the principles of intellectual honesty, which quite literally is, hey, new information is introduced. Stop tying yourself egoically to dumb shit that you learned because you thought it was a fact and now it's not a fact anymore and allow your opinion to switch because you're a human, you're ever changing. Your mindset is always going to be different. It, you know, I mean, if you're selling a diet pill, yeah, it's very hard to go, Hey, actually all this stuff in here doesn't work. Don't sell a diet pill. Then Realize there's a lot more to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then it, you know, becomes tough because people's whole lives are tied to their beliefs 
whether it's the money that they're making or in some other way, you know, they tie their identity to it. They tie their personality to it. And yeah, yeah. so that, it becomes really tough to separate. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'll do some stuff sometimes and all the friends go, dude, why do you do that? And I'm like, okay, great. I'll never do that again. Like, because now that it's pointed out and it's conscious, I'm like, this is not something that I want to be in the picture of who I am. Well, where does, for you, the, the questioning and really finding the information come from? Is that something in middle school, high school, or why did that mindset get triggered? Um, I think it's a lot of it started with, well, so what I was going to say is I think a lot of it started with health and nutrition where what I was reading was so contradictory to what I was being told elsewhere mainstream um, that it, I recognize that not everything we're told is, <laughs> is true. You can, which I mean, yeah. everyone says that they know it or everyone, everyone knows it, but we don't always practice it. Um, so, so that probably kickstarted it is as I was so focused on the subject and, and I don't know what, well, I do know what caused me to have an open mind, or at least what I think did is, is that what I was doing originally wasn't working. The, the eating yeah. less thing was not working. It, yeah. six pack came, <laughs> you know, it was like, it's not like the abs were getting more defined or anything. Um, I just started feeling worse. So, uh, yeah, so that was probably like that, that experience probably changed that outlook. And then as I've dug more and especially when I found Ray Pete's work, um, yeah. that, those were pretty substantial changes in mindset as well. Totally. And Ray's work is so contrary to most viewpoints. That is what I love about it. But he's like, no authoritarianism. And then you go into the forums and they're like, don't, Ray never said you could do that. And it's like, <laughs> like Ray purposely doesn't say shit or says shit because he's like, you guys are so dumb. Like, just chill out. Just relax. Like, have some ice cream. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of misrepresentation and people tend to focus a lot on on very particular things that he says, you know people focus a lot on the supplements and the hormones yep. and which I mean, yeah. it's yeah. And, and then a lot of it is because Ray's work can be difficult to digest. And yeah. so, you know, people are trying to look at what other people are saying about it and, and it gets distorted, man. And this is why I wanted, I was, my friend Tim was working on this for a while, but he stopped breaking these down into similar or into uh, simple to digest uh, segments, like all his articles and calling it repeat Ray Pete. Okay, that's cool. That's what I want. And then it never came. I mean, I like to read the whole thing because I'm like, okay, where is he coming from? But most of it sums up to my advice to most people. Like, I have stress. I can't sleep. What's going on? I'm like, eat some ice cream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I know that Danny Roddy wrote the, the Pete Whisperer, which that was yeah. kind of his, you know, his interpretation of his work, which... So, so I do think that I understand why he kind of took that book away and yeah, because I don't know, I think it, it's better to have Danny's interpretation be his own kind of work as opposed to trying to put words in Ray's mouth, you know, which is what a lot of, a lot of people are kind of doing. So I don't know, it's a tough balance to strike because he's so influential and, and his, he makes some really good points, but, um, yeah. yeah, so there, it can be tough to separate in a way, but yeah. I don't know. Yeah, on the mindset of that, though, is there anything that you're currently questioning? So it could be, we just talked about politics. We don't have to go into that. Um, I normally don't like to go into that. Uh, doorknobs, how they work, uh, <laughs> errors, why they fold, whatever it is, something that is in common consensus. You see it all the time, and you're like, I just don't think it works that way. Um. Well, kind of with having this, this open mind, critical thinking, the, the questioning aspect is always there to a point. Um, so, I mean, a couple of subjects I've been interested in that I've been questioning kind of the mainstream views. So I've been looking into economics a little bit more um, and then also ancient history yeah, and like geology. So I mean, they, they work together. Well, all of it works together. That's the craziest part is that looking at all these different disciplines, um, that there's this, you, you have this so often where the mainstream there's, there's an agenda a lot of times yeah. and there's an encouragement for people to think a certain way. And a lot of times when you question that you find a lot of other really valuable information that can change the way you think and that, and there's a lot of parallels between all of those different, like all of the more or less mainstream views. There's so many 
parallels between them, so many commonalities between them. Um, there, you know, like if you want to consider like the genetic determinism or neo Darwinism yep. of medicine and health, and you can compare that to the uniformitarianism or gradualism in geology and and history compared to like catastrophism. Yeah, and so so like there's like so many parallels there where you have this mainstream view where like it's, it's, I mean, I don't want to say control cause it's not about having control per se, but In a sense, um, right. yeah. Um, yeah. Don Miguel Ruiz always talks about black magic or, or white magic, which is like black magic is like when you tell someone they're stupid or they can't do enough. Um, and this is similar where like it controls the mindset. It is kind of mm-hmm. like that curse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I was trying to think more specifically as far as the views go. So in genetic determinism, it's that our health is more or less defined by our genes. There's nothing we can really do about it. Our environment doesn't affect it. So we can just treat the symptoms. That's kind of what we're left with. Yeah. And you have, uh, so I guess it's not a perfect parallel with the gradualism idea because with the gradualism idea, it's almost the opposite where you have this idea that we have more impact on our environment and more control over it as opposed to less, yeah. which you have this feeling of, of safety, but there's, I mean, there's, so there's, I guess, particular agendas behind it. Um, you could say, whereas opposed to catastrophism, which is, which was kind of tied with like religion and ideology in that way. And so it was kind of pushed away, but, but when you, so I guess kind of going back to the control thing is so from the genetic side, you have medicine is, is in control because the only thing you can do is, yeah. is use medication. So, Yep. From this, so if catastrophism is the leading ideology, well, there's this idea that everything can be wiped away in a second by a massive comet impact or, or whatever it is, um, which has happened, you know, in our, <clears throat> or there's a lot of evidence that that kind of thing has happened. In so, we'll when, dive into that in a second. But. Sure, yeah. Well, well, and so from that view, then, like, if you have the idea that everything can be wiped down in a second, it, you're kind of freed in a way. Yeah. Whereas if you have this view that, um, we have control over everything. It's, it's like you have to fall in line. Um, so th- there's kind of that, that parallel, I guess you could say. Totally. And I think so. One, Darwinism, I don't like that it, uh, it, you can't actually put it in a study. You can't figure it out. So you, you can't take Darwinism, Darwinism, whatever. And because I read the, the book From Bacteria to Bach and Back, and like most of that is about Darwin type thinking. And it's like, hey, evolution, all this. You can't take evolution and put it next to something else. And we've never had another option or ideology that can parallel it in a scientific way. But in uh, Solve for Happy, he goes into the algorithm that would have made it possible for, or not the algorithm, but the odds of a human being in the time that it says that we evolved from a chimpanzee to okay. actually come to existence and he's like there is no possibility that in this amount of time humans evolve from a chimpanzee a whole nother species mind you to what they are now but then we're going into ancient history right because i'm i'm a i'm you call it a geek nerd whatever it is i <laughs> ridiculous when it comes to research there's all those caves that are like thirty thousand years old buried and dug underground those are areas where when uh, Younger Dryas II, which is the comet that came in and theoretically started that ice, uh, which melted and created Washington in like two weeks, like all the mountains, the beautiful, like, which is ridiculous. That's where those people hid who were alive then. And then we can go down some deep rabbit holes that I know, <laughs> uh, Graham Hancock and uh, all of the secret teachings of ancient history. Cause it's, I mean, we think that we're so unique and that we came up with all this, like, there's cave paintings in every single major uh, area across the world from like 13,000 BC that show the same dude with the same watch and the same piece of luggage. And it's like, yeah, you could say it's like a weird coincidence, but I don't think so. And I, I can be challenged, of course, intellectual honesty, but like at this point. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of interesting things to find on that rabbit hole. But in talking about the, the genetic determinism, neo-Darwinism idea, I mean, there is quite a bit of evidence, kind of research evidence, as far as the alternative Lamarckian view. And, and Lamarckism is misrepresented in almost every textbook, the idea that you cut off a rat's tail and then it's 
babies are born without tails. Like that's not what yeah. he was, that's not what he was saying. <laughs> um, but so there, there's a lot of really interesting evidence um, in favor of this where, so like one, for example, is these Mexican cave fish where they, they found what they thought were two different species of fish, one that would live near the surface and one that would live farther down in, in these caves where it was in, it, like extremely dark. Yeah. There's no light. And these ones in the caves didn't have eyes. And the ones that were at the surface had eyes. And they found out that they're actually the same species. And that when you move the ones with eyes down to the caves and vice versa, within a couple of generations, I think, I don't, I don't remember how many, but, yeah. but way quicker than Darwinian, the, the neo-Darwinian model requires. Um, they lost, yeah, well, <laughs> right, yeah. So way quicker, they, they lost their eyes. They're not lost them. It, it was an adaptation to the yeah. dark where eyes are obviously really energy expensive. And so having eyes wasn't worth it when there's no light. So, you know, in just a couple of generations, they lost their eyes, which I mean, that doesn't fit into this neo-Darwinian model. And there's, there's several examples that are really interesting like that, that show that it's not, it's not quite that, you know, it's, it, there's yeah. definitely a lot of issues with this current model. Yeah. And well, like Darwin was talking, his main thing he was talking about was adaptation. And it wasn't necessarily evolution, as we talked about. Darwin right. was like, well, yeah. a weird dude. He married his cousin. Like, of course, he's the one who talks about evolution and all this stuff, and like how it could go wrong or go good. And he married his cousin, number one. So I <laughs> trust that guy. But number two, yes, like epigenetics and the ability for species to adapt, like literally, has to be fast paced. Otherwise, you're right. The comet comes and everybody dies. Yeah. 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 Well, and also I, so my understanding is that the Dar, Darwin's actual views did include adaptation, like almost more similar to Lamarckism, but with this added genetic element, whereas neo-Darwinism is kind of transformed his ideas into no environment interaction at all. Yeah. Um, well, which academics. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I haven't studied Darwin's work firsthand, so I don't know, but that's what I've heard secondhand. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, so you, What's interesting, you mentioned epigenetics, is that epigenetics really flies straight in the face of neo-Darwinism. Like it, it, it doesn't disprove it, but it's evidence against it. You don't disprove things in science. It's evidence against that hypothesis. Yet it hasn't been, it, it hasn't been presented that way. It's, it's presented as just this addition. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They're like, yeah, you'll hear like neo-Darwinism talking and they'll be like, yeah, and of course there's epigenetics too, but you know, you're like, what? What do you <laughs> Like that doesn't make any sense from what you're talking about. You're telling me that you can turn off genes in major diseases that someone has when they're, that they're born with. And this is something that I think needs to be publicized more is that, okay, yeah, your doctor told you you have X or you got a test and it says you have X, but that doesn't actually mean you have X because if you do things properly, X is gone because guess what? It's methylated and it's fine. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I... I'm very uh, against uh, a lot of the common consensus when it comes to most things like uh, Orwellian, like just like you were saying, Lamarckism got um, changed. Distorted, when you say, yeah. like, oh, it's an Orwellian uh, future that we're coming about or something like that. It's like, no, Orwell was saying, don't let this happen. And now it's like, oh, no, this is the future that he was envisioning. It's like, no, yeah. like, no, 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 not this thing. <laughs> all these people that like it becomes an ism typically mm -hmm. it's the opposite thing that they were trying to say and i i read a whole like uh, piece about that and it was like try just i don't know if you talk more about the negative like you're going to be known for the bad thing and not the good thing you were trying to promote interesting so it's uh i don't know like how that fits into <laughs> it's like only talk about the good maybe but then you can't acknowledge the bad if you don't bad and something bad could happen and you're like oh i didn't know about it yeah yeah well i don't know i guess you can't control how other how other people represent you you know totally so your dive down economics what have you found thus far um so i've been following peak prosperity are you familiar with them mm, i'm not but i might be i'm not familiar with the name but i might be in uh information okay well so I don't know, some parallels you have in economics is kind of this idea that, um, you know, we're going to interrupt the business cycle, you know, the feds, um, yeah. okay. influence, 
you could say I'm printing of money, all, all that. So, so there's, I think that that's, there's, there's some parallels there, but, but anyways, the more fundamental issue is, is what peak pros, what they talk about at peak prosperity is, is again, how energy is one of the more fundamental or is the fundamental aspect of economics as well, which I think is really cool. So you have, they separate into, I think they call it primary wealth, secondary wealth, tertiary wealth. So primary wealth is the energy sources. So you have oil, you have food, you have people who can perform work, things like that. And then secondary would be, um, so secondary would be, I think I'm getting this right, would be like money, something that can get you that primary thing. And then tertiary would be like stocks. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, so there, there's this idea that the, that the, there's a huge disconnect between like, so secondary tertiary wealth are supposed to be representative of the previous, you know, so they're all supposed to be representative of the amount of energy in something. So you buy a mango for whatever cost, yeah. what's in that is the cost for the, you know, the energy in the mango, the energy to grow the mango, the energy to transport the mango. Um, but because there's this interference now with pricing, there's a huge separation between whether it's the evaluation of a company and their stock evaluation and things like that. There's, there's a huge difference between that prime, you know, that primary wealth and, and what we're valuing things as. And that's causing a lot of issues. Um, so it's kind of like on the more fundamental level. And then you have, so basically like the idea that when the dollar, when we went off gold, that separated the, the, this secondary wealth of the dollar from the primary wealth, because there was nothing tying it into yeah. reality. Um, yeah. whereas gold, you know, gold, you have a finite amount of it. Um, and so from then on, there, we've had a lot of fluctuation in business cycles and if you want to call it that, and then interference with them and kind of not going down a good path. But basically the, the danger is then that because we're so separated from this primary wealth that because our prices aren't tied to the actual price of getting oil out of the ground or the actual price of human work, we can then find ourselves in a situation where we don't have enough energy left and the prices haven't risen to offset it. So if oil, if we had a really small amount of oil, the price should be really high. And then that would basically force us to use other forms of energy like solar power. But yeah. because there's so much interference there, then we may not recognize the lack of oil that we have. And then there's, we haven't put anything else in place to, you know, let's say produce solar power. And then we have this whole society that's built around oil and we don't have enough oil. And so, so there's like a ton of different like intricacies in all of those yeah. pieces, but um, it's basically just this, there's so many issues with this current model of economics that we have. Totally. Yeah. So one, I wanted to bring up multi-potentialites. This was just brought to me a bit ago. Uh, I think you're one of them. And it's someone who likes to gather information from like everywhere and then okay. like relate it, use it together. There's a, I gotta look what it is. The Putty Tribe is a group of people who share information. I'm about to get on that because I'm like, it's so cool. But okay. when it comes to economics, yeah, I have a, I have a cryptocurrency website as well. Um, and reading like the creature of Jekyll Island and all these books, like money is BS. It's just almost completely fictionalized and is used as a means of uh, trust for communication in tribes that were bigger than what we thought the Dunbar's number could hold, which when I talked to David Burkas, the network scientist, he was like, yeah, the numbers actually were on 650, not like 150. Okay, but, interesting. Yeah, but when it comes down to it, like what you're saying, oil, anything like that, it's this disconnect we have between money and what it's for. And so like people get so um, mad when the price of oil raises. I'm like, you're using it oil up. Like realize it's going to get higher. You can't always have lower gas prices because if you continue to have lower gas prices, then exactly what you said happens. We're like, oh no, we're out of gas. They're like, wait, what? Like, yeah, no, 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 we're just we're out like completely. Like, <laughs> can I just pay more? No, you can't pay more. We're completely out. And when you don't realize that there's these finite resources, then that's when things get bad because you do have to pay more for things that are more limited, and that's how life is supposed to be. People will say, yeah, but what about, it doesn't matter what about, because time, one of those resources, it's going away. It's going away every single day. Oil, food, all of it, it is going away. 
And so it is going to become more expensive the more people there are, no matter what. Right. Well, yeah. And, and the economic model is built on infinite growth and you can't have infinite growth without, with, without infinite resources, which obviously our resources are finite. And that's an assumption that economics isn't built on like yeah. the current Cartesian model that they said, totally. yeah. I think. I'm, Sleep, yes. And that's why Jeff Bezos is trying to get to Mars and then be able to mine and get resources from somewhere else and bring it to earth. And that's why, or not Mars, I forget what the, the asteroids or planets. And then that's why Elon Musk is like, no, I'm going to Mars and bringing people with me. And it's still like, I don't know. I'm totally, I love, the capitalism model it needs a little bit more humanistic element but the fact of the matter is there's resources you only have a certain amount they're going to be worth either the people who perform the best and do the best for the world get them or they become more money and then those people still get them because they're making more money there's a value system there has to be and it's based on energy yeah yeah well and there's so there's a balance there i mean between if you want to call it capitalism and socialism. And, yeah. and so we're, you know, I think it's important not to see it as black and white and to see it as a spectrum and obviously too far on any side causes issues. Yeah. And it's a question of based on our society, based on our world that we're in right now, where, where are we best fit with? Um, I do think that, that some are more ideal than others, but they require an ideal society an ideal world. And so yeah. sometimes those, you know, it's not really applicable. So I don't know. I mean, that's a, a very deep rabbit hole that we could go down yeah. if we wanted to. Yeah. But. yeah, it's funny. The same people who want the ideal society are normally the people who function the opposite way. Yeah. They're, they're like, no, it's good. We Everybody has to be able to, but I don't trust that guy. So like <laughs> well, I mean, I'd, I'd love an ideal society, but it's not what we have right now. Yeah. You know, so I don't think that it makes sense to apply a political system that's that won't you know that we know is not going to work yeah in that scenario things will be interesting but i want to leave this interview with energy okay everything energy is everything yeah economics if it's trying to find ancient history and realizing that the only way that they do that is by carbon dating carbon dating is just looking at the energy of half life so carbon whatever it is health energy and thank you so much for being on the show. Where can people find you before we sign off? Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, jfeldmanwellness.com. I've got free articles on there. You can sign up for free mini email courses. And then I, I also offer one-on-one consultation and you know a more extensive seven-week course. Um, so you can check all that out there. And then on social media, if you search J Feldman Wellness, you'll find it. On some of them, it's JF Wellness, but just search Jay Feldman Wellness and, and you'll oh. definitely find it on Facebook, Instagram, soon to be YouTube, but not quite yet. Uh, awesome. I think those are the main ones. So. Hell yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on, man. And I, I mean, conversations going in another route, so we'll definitely have to chat about this again soon, but less of the health, more of the, the extraneous thoughts. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Austin. Thanks for having me.